So welcome everyone to this Knowledge Rights 21 webinar, the AI Orphan. This is our first webinar back after the after the Northern Hemisphere summer. And in particular, it, this webinar is taking place at a time where there's some really intense discussions taking place and very intensive lobbying taking place in Brussels, in particular around artificial intelligence. And so we're really happy to be able to organize this on a hot topic right now. Um, my name is Stephen Weiber. I work at the International Federation of Library Associations, and we are heavily involved in Knowledge Rights 21, which of course is the organization that's putting this work, that's putting this webinar together. Knowledge Rights 21 is put is, is there in order to make sure that the needs, that the experience of researchers, of educators, of, of citizens, of readers, of learners, and the libraries that support them is actually heard in policy discussions. We are active over a range of different questions, from ebooks to secondary publishing rights, to rights retention, to open norms, really looking to make sure that the way that knowledge, the access to knowledge, the creation of knowledge, the sharing of knowledge is regulated in Europe is favorable to competitiveness, to the solving of challenges, to equity. Um, in effect, we work therefore to bring those changes to happen, to bring, make, make those changes happen. And of course, it's a really interesting time to do it at a time that you have a new European Commission coming in, new people taking up mandates. And certainly there's been some really relevant points we've seen that I'll mention very quickly in some of the less let, mission letters that have been given to commissioners. Now, clearly there's a lot of events going on at the moment around artificial intelligence. Um, but of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that there have been so many that they're entirely comprehensive, that they're really covering all of the issues that are most relevant. It's important, therefore, to step, take a step back, to look at what the parameters of the AI debate now are, who is present in these discussions and who is missing. One answer in terms of who is missing is arguably research. And this is not, sadly, a new thing. We've seen time and time again that the interests of researchers, of research institutes, are not necessarily thought of when legislation, when regulation is being passed around copyright, around the wider digital environment. There's a lot of hope right now. There's much, much to celebrate in the fact that within Europe, the letter and the Draghi reports, as well as the mission letter sent by Commission President von der Leyen to, to new commissioners, really aim to put science and innovation at the heart of our efforts to ensure Europe's competitiveness and therefore sustainability into the future. The key question, of course, now is how that is going to happen. Now, I'm conscious that this may seem like a bit of a narrow focus. I'm just going to reshare my screen again. Um, but I know that certainly, uh, so th 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 this may look like quite a narrow focus, but it's also, it's all, there's also a really good reason for talking about copyright, because that's certainly an area where there's been a lot of focus, a lot of efforts by MEPs to try and dig up the Aki, to try and change laws within Europe. But I think one point we want to make is that it's really important to remember that copyright is just one of many tools available to regulate AI. And I think we'd certainly argue it's far from the most relevant, it's far from the most useful. There's great work going on elsewhere around how to apply privacy regulations, how to apply ethics within the research to AI. And certainly when we think that when, when the EU's lawmakers come to think about how to make sure that AI is both successful and safe, they need to be ready to look across all of the tools available and to combine those and to combine and, and, and to deliver those, to use those that will make the biggest um, biggest difference possible. So I think this slide looks to make it clear that we will be focusing primarily on copyright and licensing, on scholarly communications, on, on, on what's going on around standard research material, unless we suggest otherwise. We won't Again, unless we suggest otherwise, be digging into these other areas. But I think we really want to come across to look at this question of what happens, how can we make sure that in taking those decisions, especially around copyright, around information regulation, we're not necessarily we're, we're considering the interests of research. Now, while new MEPs and commissioners are being heavily lobbied in Brussels, libraries are increasingly being offered con or contracts for digital content that really are trying to look to hollow out the already limited possibilities that they have to support AI research. And these, of course, are libraries, not professional contract negotiators, and too often find themselves on the back foot. And we would argue that they deserve protection. Otherwise, one of the most potential promising, but promising potential sources of ethical public interest AI risks seeing itself trying to work with a hand behind its back. So in order to discuss this, to discuss the fate of the research sector and the libraries, the other institutions that support it in the ongoing discussions about AI and what a positive way forward looks like, I'm really happy that we're joined by three excellent speakers. 
We have Ben White, who is a co-founder of Knowledge Rights 21, who is a uh, formerly head of IP at the British Library, and currently doing a PhD around AI at the University of Bournemouth. I'm very happy also that we're joined by Rachel Sandberg, who's the Director of Scholarly Communication and Information Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. And we're joined by Clemens Neudecker, who's a researcher, project manager and library hacker from Berlin, Germany. So I'm going to first of all hand over to Ben to take the floor and yeah, over to you. Uh, you're still muted there. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me just get my slides up, put them in presentation mode. I'm, I think everyone can see that, yeah. Thank you very much yes. um, and good afternoon, everyone. So I think com compared to the subsequent speakers, um, I will be dashing here, there and everywhere across across this topic from a Knowledge Rights 21 um, perspective, sort of laying some of the groundwork for Rachel and Clements um, to speak and also just underlining some of the position papers that, that we as an organisation have, have developed. Um, let me just check the time um, so I'm not too timely. So in Europe, um, Broadly, I, I've had to do it this way, obviously, due to the numerous numbers of European member states. We, in terms of copyright law, um, have two a, a number of systems in, in, in operation in terms of exceptions to the monopoly rights, the exclusive rights which copyright creates. So in the UK in 2014, uh, a, a non-commercial use of research um, exception for uh, text and data mining, data analytics, as the legislation talks about, was introduced. Um, and that doesn't allow circumvention of technical protection measures. So, for example, capture technology um, can prevent uh, non-commercial research um, or using machine learning. Um, and But it does prevent contracts from overriding the user right to uh, undertake data analysis. If we, if we move to the EU, the Copyright in the Digital Single Market Directive in 2019 introduced two exceptions. Um, ultimately, uh, when, it, when the proposal was first made, there was only one, what has become Article 3, but now there are two exceptions. Article 3, which I'll talk about a bit later, is essentially for research organisations and cultural heritage organisations. Um, it is possible to circumvent technical protection measures for research purposes, unlike the UK exception. And uh, like the UK, it does not allow, Article 3 does not allow contractual preemption of, of copyright law, i.e., Essentially, it doesn't matter what the contract says if it prevents your right to undertake uh, machine learning, then um, you can ignore the contract. So at the higher level, that's what we've ended up with. My keyboard doesn't work. Um, so as I've said, Article 3, text and data mining for the purposes of scientific research. The beneficiaries are research organisations, cultural heritage organisations. You must have lawful access to that content um, and uh, override by contract or technical protection measures of this user right is not permitted. Article 4, exceptional limitation for text and data mining. Anybody can benefit from this exception. Um, it does actually, however, allow a rights reservation. So rights holders can prevent the exercise of this exception in law as long as it is as long as it has been expressly reserved by the rights holder in an appropriate manner. Um, we don't know what that means. There's a case law. There's case law. I think. Um, we might get case law today from Germany in terms of this case that I referenced at the bottom, which, as far as the German courts are concerned, 
might give us some clue what uh, as to what expressly reserved by rights holders in an appropriate manner might mean. Uh, I don't know if 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 the ruling is out today, but it's certainly scheduled to be. So it creates a situation where contractual and technological prevention override is essentially permissible in contrast with Article 3. So, so that's sort of the law at the very high level in Europe. And taking a step back, as, as Stephen uh, referenced earlier on, um, you know, as we all know, artificial intelligence, machine learning is a general purpose technology. It is creating huge wealth um, for, for actors in this field. And it is, uh, you know, propelling many, many uh, activities that we're very used to from spam filters, routing software on your phone through to generative AI and in the scientific uh, field you know, models essentially creating predicting new antibiotics so it's you know wide usages and of which as consumers some are very useful and some like the antibiotics example has huge societal import um so we have what is called the innovation paradox in europe which is good basic research, so high levels of funding for research, but compared to other parts of the world, uh, and a comparative inability to transfer that research into um, sort of societal and economic benefit, i.e. in Europe, um, companies struggle to essentially take and develop um, uh, and, and commercialise research compared to other parts of the globe. And that's called the innovation paradox, which is a subject of the Enrico Letter Report of 2024, which as you can see there in the quote, um, underlines the importance of knowledge transfer, knowledge valorization, basic research being spun out by research organizations and universities um, and, and, and commercialized. And one of the reasons for that is a highly fragmented regulatory environment, according to the report. Just come out is another former Italian prime ministers. They're all lining up to do reports at the moment. Uh, a report from Mario Draghi, The Future of European Competitiveness, commissioned by uh, Ursula von der Leyen. And again, here, we're, you can see the quote, we're failing to translate innovation into commercialization. Um, and scaling up. And these companies are hindered at every stage by inconsistent and restrictive regulation. So again, very similar to the letter report. Um, good research, but, but challenges actually commercializing uh, material. And you might ask what why copyright is relevant to any of this? Well, copyright is highly relevant because it is no longer something that regulates the book trade. Those of you that know its history, it was developed in uh, the 17, well, I guess the late 1600s, early 1700s um, to regulate the book trade. But because all computer technologies, all information technologies copy, Copyright essentially acts as a regulator of all corners of the digital economy. And that, that is why copyright is, is, is perhaps not acknowledged, but is an, an important regulator of how fast innovation and research can take place. So looking at the AI economy in particular, um, Joseph Stiglitz, the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, has stated that it is hard to conceive of an AI economy being competitive. So we have these very large um, players, um, almost all of whom are from the United States or in Asia from China and Japan, Japan being particularly um, strong in areas such as autom automotive AI technologies and robotics. So essentially, we have these very large players um, that, that dominate 
information technology markets for those reasons that I've sort of noticed, uh, noted rather, which um, I won't go into in detail, um, but I think, you know, economies of scale and scope economists will understand that important to why these natural AI monopolies uh, have exist is the reliance on data that underpins um, and reinforces the intense market disequilibrium that we see network effects which mean which mean that moving from one technology provider to another becomes increasingly difficult they have low foreign investment footprints so knowledge transfer from where they're based is very difficult um, and as we know, intellectual property rights also creates a monopoly uh, in terms of the information. And, you know, here we're talking about information technology. So there are these clear effects which reinforce um, the, the highly uncompetitive nature of information technology markets and AI markets like we're talking about today. Um, Jonathan Haskell is a very well-known British economist, and um, he's done a lot of work around intangible asset markets, um, of which obviously all technology providers, I think now all top 10 um, companies listed in on the American Stock Exchange are essentially intangible asset companies, um, all technology companies now. Um, and he his view is that the issue here is barriers to market entry. Compet ex post competition law cannot solve the problem. In in Jonathan Haskell's view, it's actually about uh, reducing barriers to market entry. And this, uh, as far as we're concerned at Knowledge Rights Twenty One, from a research perspective. We see, as we will talk about today, that there are many barriers that are put in in place of researchers who want to access information and then share it with their colleagues or, in the case of public-private partnerships, with their partners who they are working with. And I guess it, it's important to state that the public sector is very important in the AI environment because... Um, you know, some of the cutting edge models have been developed in universities and universities and research organizations are able to invest in cutting edge AI um, that might have no commercial benefit. So actually, a lot of the cutting edge AI uh, material is, 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 is can come from from public sector in a way that that, that private sectors just won't won't invest. Um, so one of the issues that we see is we've ha we have these exceptions which talk about text and data mining or, or data analytics in the UK, and publishers are asserting that, that these exceptions do not allow um, any other form of um, data analysis than text and data mining. So, so we're aware, talking to universities and research organizations who are licensing, which Rachel will talk about a lot, that essentially they're saying you can do text and data mining, whatever that might be, but you can't do artificial intelligence, um, other forms. And, and we can sort of see this in in in. Uh, contracts. So, for example, this contract, except as permitted under applicable law and these participation terms, i.e. except as allowed by the exceptions um, or, or this contract, prohibitions to using our licensed material. Um, I use the word our very liberally there. Um, it, you know, you cannot use this material for other purposes is, is essentially what this this is saying here making making a difference however this this actually doesn't stand up to any scrutiny i would suggest if you look at the the definition in the directive text and data mining means any automated analytical technical an analytical technique technique, sorry, which includes but is not limited to the kinds of things one 
sort of associates with um, text and data mining, such as patterns, trends, and correlations. So the directive itself is is very explicit. The text and you know text and data mining as a term is used, but um, that the, the intention is that it can be that this term is used to mean any sort of automated analytical tool which aims to analyze data, which is essentially the definition of artificial intelligence, I would argue. Um, since then, we've obviously had the AI Act in Europe, and the AI Act says in regards to the development of general purpose AI models, such as large language models, generative AI, et cetera, et cetera, that it must comply with the directive that I, ju that I just referred to. So other legislation makes it clear that the development of general purpose AI, generative AI, its training, your models, et cetera, clearly is permissible under the directive. Otherwise, it wouldn't have to say that. I think you know we can we can also uh, say that as the as the directive makes clear that temporary copying exceptions in European law can also be used for certain AI technologies. Um, so, so again, there you I don't think we need to. We can also look not just at these data analytics, machine learning specific exceptions, I think we also need to sort of say, well, actually, some forms of machine learning are permissible under temporary copying exceptions in the law, as as uh, as the recitals to the directive actually make clear. And then I would also sort of point out that it's rather difficult to undertake text and data mining using certain sorts of models, models that rely on training, such as neural networks. Um, because certainly in the research in the research area, you're probably unlikely to sort of take off the shelf neur neural network models, for example, and just uh, analyze the data that you've got. You're very likely, I would argue, in many research instances to actually want to train the model yourselves on your own data. So it seems pretty inconceivable that the directive allows you to do text and data mining, data analytics, machine learning, but um, you can't do it because you can't train the model in order to undertake the act, which is explicitly allowed. So I think our universities and negotiators perhaps need to take these points um, on board and, and push back in their negotiations with, with publishers. So why are publishers essentially preventing AI use um, when they license? Um, you know, we can imagine, um, and, you know, my, my, my view is as an ex-publisher that they're doing what they always do, which is um, use copyright um, assert the copyright creates absolute monopolies, which which doesn't do, of course, because we have exceptions. So what they're essentially trying to do is is maximise the bottom line here, and I think kind of control the end to end of the machine learning process, which for many of the models depends on training. So essentially, by trying to say control the training of the model. They're also trying to assert control over the creation of the software itself, something which copyright law is clearly not there to do, um, and also also trying to 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 kind of control the outputs and therefore downstream outputs as well as downstream markets in 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 terms of the software that can be created through the training processes. I guess. A couple of points which I'll just rattle through, you know, how much of this control is really publisher content. Scopa states that 38% of articles last year were publicly funded and therefore should be open. Um, whether they're discoverable, of course, depends on the interface. But this, this, this control, I think, needs to be questioned given the strong levels of public funding of articles for them to be open. Not all models train 
Um, so again, that's something that I think negotiators need to be aware of. Um, even if the model is trained, you know, norm as a rule, extracting the the content um, is not going to be possible. You know, to, to not only the form of the model and the form <clears throat> that the data now is represented in the model in terms of parameters is not something that lends itself to easy extraction. And certain models that have been trained won't contain the data anyway. And again, the sort of the outputs of the models, you know, copyright there is copyright is there to control um, in 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 Europe, original expression, the author's own intellectual creation. Um, you know, surely it depends what kind of outputs you're you're producing. Um, we see a pushback coming from publishers and also some collecting societies saying that universities shouldn't use um, generative AI or even translation software because, um, you know, content is, is, is consumed by these models. Well, that isn't, again, lawful. We have lots of exceptions, private copying exceptions, personal copying exceptions, fair dealing in the UK, teaching exceptions, which allow you to make copies. Um, as the user, the back end again, we have the temporary copying exception that that could protect um, the the technology companies, and certainly in the university space, many of the enterprise software like um, Microsoft Copilot, for example, explicitly states that they don't retain any of the data. So I think you know the, 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 this sort of blanket "you cannot use our content" needs to be pushed back on very, very strongly. So moving now to the exceptions themselves, very quickly, um, Article Three and uh, Section Twenty Nine A of the UK Copyright Act. Um, one problem is in both that it's silent on how researchers share content. So in copyright terms, the, the making available um, communication to the public, there is no reference to this. So the law is not fit for purpose because it doesn't allow, allow partners or colleagues to actually share data very clearly. Um, I mean, we do have German copyright law, which is a good implementation of Article 3, which explicitly allows the sharing of content. So the exceptions themselves are not very well crafted. There's no cross-border effect in the CDSM directive. And yet, and yet we have a European research area. We have research commission funding that requires people from different countries to be part of projects in order to get EU funding in, in, in the AI machine learning space. We have universities collaborating to offer a single degree. So a student or a researcher can work in three or four different universities in different countries. So the cross-border effect is a serious defect with, with, with the directive or lack of it, I should say, is a severe de defect. And as a result of this, we're aware of publicly funded important data centers that are refusing to work with researchers from other countries. So that, you know, there is a real world effect from, from kind of poor, poor dra drafting of legislation. As I said earlier on, Article 4 uh, allows what is called a, a rights reservation. So it essentially says you cannot train your data. From an innovation perspective, the innovation paradox, you know, by limiting the volume of data and perhaps e an equally important volumes of the right kind of data, although European govern gov governments are talking about safer AI and wanting safer AI, baked into the law, I mean, the UK doesn't even allow commercial uh, development of AI explicitly through the rights reservation in the directive. We're limiting the models that can be created because 
of, because um, yeah, we're, we're saying rights holders can can stop organizations that have legal access to the content from actually undertaking text and data mining. So this inevitably will mean that AI developed in Europe is more is going to be more prone to bias and poor predict predictability and therefore just not going to be as good as as machine learning in theory develops in in more liberal copyright regimes such as Japan, Singapore, uh, South Korea and and the United States. This might not be a problem if you're developing pop music or um models that 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 differentiate dogs from cats but clearly it is an ear it an issue in the scientific r d research intensive industry sector you know medicine so so this is i think a severe problem with the development of uh european copyright law that it is essentially inbuilt um that it is not going to be as good as that develops in more liberal regimes and 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 that it because it limits the volume of data um, and therefore the, the right kind of data, volume of the right kind of data that models need to make good predictions, it's going to promote bias. Another issue that we are aware of, I would, I would urge everyone to read this excellent blog piece from Europeana on, again, on the opt-outs, in Article 4, so Europeana challenging. So, for example, the Royal Library in the Netherlands has stopped on their website. There are terms and conditions saying that you cannot use the website um, for commercial purposes. And yet this is public money. And as we know, public money is being used, um, is, is invested through research councils, you know, taxpayer money, uh, across Europe, we estimate over 120 billion euros is used to invest in 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 research, and this money is not invested for it to stop at the university front door or cultural heritage front door. It's for downstream commercial use, and therefore, I, I think quite rightly, this Europeana blog highlights questions what the Royal Library in the Netherlands is doing here using public money to um to 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 prevent downstream um benefits let's say um from smes journalists and 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 others um i mean i would say as somebody that's worked in the library sector you know a core professional pr principle is freedom of information and freedom of expression which this this really does fly in the face of. So, you know, I, we would argue that it is not up to cultural or in publicly funded institutions to determine who is good open and who is bad open. Open is open. Um, very quickly, just wrapping up here, um, Obviously, in Europe, we make a distinction between commercial research and non-commercial research in terms of our copyright exceptions, which is something that uh, many other um, jurisdictions, I would say the majority of jurisdictions, do not do. They just have research exceptions. And therefore, this divide between commercial and non-commercial in Europe makes public-private partnerships, knowledge valorization essentially impossible in in this area which depends on so much content which you just simply cannot license again wrapping up really a reference to the EUAI act um quite rightly there um, there are transparency obligations in there um we're concerned um, that those transparency obligations have been pushed by the entertainment industries and the publishing industries as a way of controlling upstream what sort of research uh, universities can do. 
um, you know, the normal model is that the university the university will undertake, you know, do some research and then it is spun out. Um, so in the context of public-private partnerships, we are saying that the transparency requirements from the AI office should not be retrospective upstream. Universities upstream do not know downstream how it will be used because they're not mind readers and therefore any obligations around transparency can only start prospectively, not retrospectively, from the point that there is commercial intent to develop um, sort of general purpose technologies. Another, another question a former colleague from the British Library often talks about is how much of this is really new. Search, of course, is a form of machine learning. Um, our universities and cultural heritage organisations have entered into public-private partnerships for many years, um, and misrepresentation of works didn't start with ChatGPT. It obviously goes back millennia. Um, if you're interested in, in any of this, please look at our website. Uh, if you go to resources in the top right hand corner and then drop down position statements, you can see a position um, statement here as well as a primer. And thank you very much for listening and apologies for going slightly over. Thank you very much. I think that gives us an extremely uh, a fantastic base, but I think also un underlines a few really key points that we don't necessarily always think about. I think it's very easy and it's probably actually quite useful to paint AI as being certain things, paint it as replacing the work of artists, to paint it as being only carried out by certain firms and by certain people for certain needs. That's politically helpful. And and actually running through, you know, underlining that there is lots going on in the public sector. And I think all, all the efforts to call for public interest AI is likely to pass through public sector research. And that really crucial question about when is the right time to regulate AI? Is it upstream by controlling the inputs? Is it downstream by looking at the outputs is also really a really crucial one in terms of, and, and it, it's a word that Europe, Europe's loved for decades in terms of what's the most proportionate way of achieving goals. So with that, um, with no further wait, I, I would like to hand over to Rachel, who, as, as Ben said, brings the practical experience of being a scholarly communications librarian trying to deal with AI for the best. So Rachel, over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very good. Great. Um, so thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, discuss these issues. Um, as Ben and Stephen have said, I will be demonstrating how publishers are using contracts to curtail lawful and essential AI usage and training in scholarly research, um, which they are doing through electronic resource agreements that they use when licensing access to institutions to their content. So to ground what I'm going to discuss, I thought it would be helpful to share that to support text and data mining and other computational research, including uh, computational research that incorporates AI. Uh, where I work, the UC Berkeley Library invests approximately $12 million each year licensing electronic content. We secure campus access to a wide range of electronic scholarly resources, including electronic books, electronic scientific journals, databases, multimedia resources, data sets, and more. And in doing so, we endeavor to negotiate, quote, researcher-friendly licensing terms uh, that preserve both fair use and text and data mining rights, which are essential to ensuring that our scholars can make computational uses of the materials that we have licensed for them. So why do we have to contract to preserve uses that are already allowed under the law. Um, because I'm speaking from a US perspective, I wanna quickly first uh, tell you how I know these rights are already allowed to underscore why it's such a problem that we now have to negotiate to save them. So uh, as been mentioned in the European Union, you have articles three and four of the Copyright Digital Single Market Directive. And these expressly carve out the right for scholars to conduct text and data mining with copyrighted works 
and including under the new AI Act, which protects those rights unhindered for Article Three uses, which are within research organizations or cultural heritage institutions. Well, in the United States, we have fair use, and all of the previous court cases that have addressed fair use in the context of computational research have confirmed that the reproduction of copyrighted works to create and text mine a collection of, of materials is indeed a fair use. In addition, these cases hold that distributing derived data, results, abstractions, metadata, or analysis from that corpus is also a fair use. And in fact, one of those court cases did inherently address AI-infused text mining because the plagiarism detection software at issue in the case relied on machine learning. And the court found that text and data mining inherently involving machine learning as one of its component steps was fair use. So for the same reasons that the text and data mining processes constitute fair use of copyrighted works in these contexts, the training of AI tools to do that text and data mining is also fair use, and especially in the nonprofit research context like ours. This is in large part because of the same transformativeness of the purpose under fair use factor one, because computational research with AI adds new understandings to copyrighted works, and because under uh, factor four, just like regular text and data mining that doesn't involve AI, AI training does not reproduce or communicate the underlying copyrighted works to the public, which is essential to a determination of whether the market has been supplanted. But even though we have these reliable exceptions like fair use, publishers are overriding these rights through con contractual agreements. And we now have to negotiate AI rights clauses rather than just relying on our fair use savings clause to be broad enough to preserve AI rights. In part, we have to do this because what happens if a publisher disagrees about the scope of what fair use allows with respect to artificial intelligence and text and data mining? Suddenly, you're in a dispute with the publisher about whether the research that was conducted was permitted. And you can avoid this risk by keeping your fair use savings clause in the license agreement, but also expressly negotiating for affirmative rights to use and train AI. This way, there can be no dispute that the particular use of AI was authorized by the agreement. But that is easier said than done because publishers are inserting extremely convoluted and nuanced restrictions on the use of AI in license agreements. And one of my greatest fears, that, um, and one that I'm actually seeing, is that institutions don't even realize what they are now agreeing uh, to give up. So it's just one example, um, and I, I don't mean any uh, shaming here. Um, I'm just illustrating the, the complexity of the situation. Uh, I wanted to take a look at what the German consortium has just agreed to with a major publisher. So they've agreed that neither the licensee, that's the, the institution, um, nor authorized users, those are the researchers, shall use any part of the content, including without limitation, any data derived from the content to develop, train, program, improve, or enrich, et cetera, any AI model or system that can be accessed by a third party. So they just agreed to never train or improve an AI tool if it's accessible or released to third parties, and to never use outputs or analysis derived from the licensed content to do any training of any third party tool uh, or of any, yeah, of any tool that is shared with others. So what does that actually mean? Um, it means that, for example, the algorithm tested and created by the following type of research conducted way back in 2017 would no longer be able to be disseminated under what Germany just agreed to. Um, as just an example, in 2017, chemists trained a generative tool on 12,000 published research papers regarding synthesis conditions for metal oxides so that the tool could identify anticipated chemical outputs and reactions for any given set of synthesis conditions that you enter into the tool. Well, the tool they created is not capable of reproducing or redistributing any of the licensed content from the papers. This is also what Ben told you. It has merely learned conditions and outcomes and can predict chemical reactions based on those conditions and outcomes. And now under the agreement Germany just entered into, um, this tool would not be able to be uh, disseminated. 
Same thing here, speaking about a, a Berkeley example, uh, the algorithm from a project like Professor David Bammons conducted in 2018 would now not be able to be disseminated under Germany's new agreement. In this project, uh, David Bammon trained an AI tool to understand whether a character is masculine or feminine by having the tool look at the tacit assumptions expressed in words associated with that character. The tool can then, once trained, the tool can then look at other texts and identify masculine and or feminine characters based on what it knows from having been trained before. And you can therefore use texts from different time periods to study the representations of masculinity and femininity over time. No licensed content, no licensed or copyrighted books, and no licensed text from a publisher is being released to the world by this tool. The tool is simply performing what a person would do, but uh, on a much larger body of works. And there are thousands of trained tools that exist that scholars have created to do things like recognize faces um, at, or detect gender that under what Germany has just agreed to with, with this publisher would never be able to be disseminated. In part, publishers are trying to stop the dissemination of these kinds of tools that now know something based on the, their licensed content. Um, they, the tools know facts based on the licensed content. And these, these facts are otherwise uh, able to have been used around the world. But this is literally the purpose of licensing content. When you license content for your faculty to read, they are learning information from that content. When they write about it or teach about the content, they are not regenerating the actual expression, the copyright protected part from the content. Um, they are conveying the lessons learned from it, facts that are not protected by copyright. So prohibiting the, the training of AI tools and the dissemination of those tools is functionally equivalent to prohibiting authorized users from learning anything about the content that you've licensed for them to learn from. And publishers should not be able to monopolize the dissemination of information learned from their content, and especially not when that information is used non-commercially. So with that in mind, when an institution reads an AI licensing clause, uh, like I said, they're, they're very convoluted now, but when an institution reads an AI licensing clause offered by publishers, we have found it really helpful to pay careful attention to distinctions made along the following lines. First, what is the publisher saying about the tool itself? And those are the quadrants in this diagram. Um, are they regulating whether the tool is homegrown versus third party? And then also whether that homegrown or third party tool is generative or non-generative. And then what is that clause saying about the use being made of the tool? That's the bubble in the middle of this diagram, um, whether the publisher is regulating just use or also training and improvement of the tool. And I will say that if a publisher fails to make these distinctions, that is also a red flag because the brush strokes of risk and prohibition are likely too broad as we saw with the German consortium consortiums agreement. So to illustrate uh, how these axes or distinctions um, or variables, whatever you wanna call them, between tools and use come into play and to underscore the importance of really negotiating the AI clause very carefully, I'm gonna give you just one example of how a project would be impacted by the agreement I showed you from Germany. Um, this, in this research project, uh, the, the researchers trained a third party non-generative topic modeling tool called Mallet using a collection of book texts so that the tool could begin to recognize gender stereotypes and representation. And then they used that trained third party tool to analyze gender representation in a much larger set of books and also to analyze representation in GPT generated stories. So third party topic, mo third party tools used in the topic modeling, this project would be pro um, prohibited from dissemination by Germany's agreement and would have all sorts of research reproducibility problems if we were uh, to prevent the, dis the dissemination of the tool. Further, no other scholars could benefit from the trained tool to ask different questions or to refine it further. And I'm sorry to say that if you think that is bad, wait until you see what this publisher has just proposed to the University of California. Um, the first paragraph of their proposal to us is what we saw uh, the German consortium agree to, uh, which is no sharing of a trained tool 
even if it's non-generative um, and regardless of whether it's homegrown or third party. But the second paragraph is perhaps even more concerning. It says that when using third party AI tools of any kind, our scholars would only be able to use limited portions of the licensed content with them and they would not be able to do any training at all of any third party tools, even if it's a non-generative tool and even if they're doing it in a completely closed hosted environment. So this proposal to the University of California is far worse than what they uh, proposed and agreed to with Germany. This wouldn't even let our scholars train a third party tool under any circumstances, much less make that tool available to others. Um, and it would also mean a flat ban on nearly every research project that I've showed you today because they all rely on training third party tools, uh, which would be utterly prohibited by the publisher in this provision. And needless to say, we will not be agreeing to it. It does not have to be like this. Hello, sweetheart. Um, it does not have to be like this. And uh, the University of California was able to negotiate rights along all four of the variables or axes I showed you before with Elsevier uh, to preserve both usage and training rights for all forms of AI I, identi I identified. So homegrown non-generative, homegrown generative, third-party non-generative, and third-party generative AI tools. We got rights for all of them. Um, what did we get? Well, essentially, for all types of AI tools, except for third party generative tools, our scholars simply need to work with the licensed content from Elsevier using reasonable security measures and ensure that the tool that they're creating or training doesn't reproduce or redistribute the Elsevier licensed content to third parties. Otherwise, there are no restrictions on training or disseminating that tool. The only type of AI tool under our agreement requiring additional precautions is third-party generative AI. For third-party generative AI, we agreed that those tools can be used provided they're in a, a self-hosted or closed-hosted environment only by our uh, authorized users and that um, we don't share the subscribed product, so the Elsevier content or any parts of it with third parties. Importantly, that third party generative tool can also be trained, provided we enter into essentially an enterprise agreement like the one Ben mentioned with uh, Microsoft, where the third party AI provider in, um, uh, in, that, in that enterprise agreement, we agree with that third party AI provider that training will occur in a closed hosted environment and the tool will only be accessed by our users. And the content that's being licensed doesn't get embedded in the tool uh, and that no licensed content gets shared out. So for now, this works just fine because it still allows us to both use and train the third party generative tools. So if you're wondering how we got there with Elsevier, uh, one part of the answer is Europe. In, in part, we relied on a CDSM Article 3 framework to say to the publishers, you have to do this in Europe and you can do so in the US too. Um, Article three in conjunction with the recent AI Act permits text and data mining. It prohibits copyright owners from opting out of having their works used with text and data mining uh, or to train AI for the purpose of conducting text and data mining. That's under the new AI Act. Uh, it prohibits contractual override of these rights and it protects copyright owners by affording them to uh, ask for appropriate security measures. And that is exactly what our license agreement with Elsevier and others have replicated. Another reason we got there with Elsevier was because of the strong presidential mandate that my office helped create throughout the University of California. Based on a lot of writing and outreach uh, that we did first with a faculty Senate committee on libraries and then the entire faculty Senate, the president of the University of California system issued a robust statement supporting our efforts to protect scholars' rights to use and train artificial intelligence in publisher negotiations. As the president said, UC scholars should not be contractually restricted by publishers from analyzing the scholarly literature by advanced computational means, and neither should researchers anywhere else. Collectively, the academy has created a corpus of scholarly literature. Collectively, we need to ensure that it can be harnessed to advance our academic as well as public service missions today and in the future. One of the pieces that my office wrote in support 
uh, along the, the, the way of getting that statement to be issued um, may be of use to you as well. I've in included the URL for our blog post, which explains what's happening with publishers' efforts to constrict the, the use of artificial intelligence tools in research. And hopefully all of these efforts uh, will help you help publishers understand that we will not be agreeing to unnecessary controls on knowledge uh, or the advancement of knowledge. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Stephen. Thank you very much indeed. And if you've been watching the chat, you will have seen the appreciation coming in, not just for your words, but I think all that you're doing. And I think this is there's, there's a fascinating example in there of what is possible and that it, you know, it is possible to have something. It's not like there's a you know, that, that, that there's no way that a publisher will ever sign up to a deal that is positive and allows libraries to, to do what they need to do. But of course, I you know it's how do we get to a situation where all lives are in that situation where we have potentially those backstops to allow us to make sure that we can get into that actual situation. So I think um, I'm conscious of the time. I want to leave a little bit of time for, for Q&A at the end and would remind everyone, please do put your questions in the Q&A and the speakers will take a look and some they'll answer live. Um, I would now like to go on to Clemens in Berlin. So Clemens, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Let me just bring up the slides which should hopefully now be visible. That looks good. That looks good. Yep, Great. it's working. Yeah, so um, yeah, like I uh, mentioned in the introduction, I'm bringing in a bit of a maybe a different perspective um, because yeah, working in a library, but as a researcher and leading a team uh, working on creating uh, machine learning and AI models. Um, so um, let me um, yeah give you my view on the issues and opportunities uh, for the cultural heritage organizations from that perspective. Next slide, yeah. So yeah, background is uh, the Berlin State Library. Just very briefly, um, I think it's a bit uh, of a unique uh, organization in the sense that it's a federation of museums, libraries, archives, and research institutes under one uh, legal entity umbrella. And um, yeah, so within the library, we, of course, we've been uh, around for uh, roughly 350 years um, with a huge collection uh, that we are continuously digitizing and uh, providing open access to. But we also, of course, have a large licensed uh, copyright databases um, um, amounting to roughly 7.5 petabytes in our digital asset repositories. Uh, we currently um, try to um, open up um, access um, as widely as possible to the res resources in collaborations with researchers, but also not excluding, uh, for example, creative industries um, through our um, library lab. Um, but like I said, we are also uh, mainly um, developers uh, in the area of AI and machine learning uh, embedded in the library. We are conducting several um, research and development projects um, that leverage uh, AI for the purposes um, of creating better open source technologies that can improve, enrich, uh, the cultural heritage uh, data that we offer for our patrons and uh, support researchers in their uh, research interests and quantitative or qualitative um, access to the data. Um, I'm quite lucky, so we uh, currently have a team of uh, nine um, full-time equivalents um, in the uh, data science department and um, yeah, um, like I said, we, uh, we create uh, tools and data sets that um, we provide openly for reuse, also for uh, commercial parties. Um, but of course, we try to do so um, in a responsible way under the consideration of any ethical, legal and social issues connected to the use of AI. So, um, yeah, um, of course, we um, have a very strong uh, um, opinion about open data. Um, the organization has um, a public domain policy by default, so um, unless there are uh, severe and justified uh, uh, restrictions, um, we provide uh, digitized collections always under a public domain license. Of course, metadata with a CC0 license, and as I've mentioned already, uh, we are continuously trying to open up um, and improve the ease of access to our data 
um, through, for example, documentation and examples and tutorials um, that we provide our through our lab. And this includes um, really um, all the convenient ways from accessing, um, for example, our APIs and interfaces through various programming languages to, um, yeah, programmatically um, harvest large amounts of data or also to simply download data dumps that we pre-compute um, and that are sometimes a bit more easy for researchers and developers to, uh, to get a, a glimpse of the data and start delving into its um, possibilities and potentials. And we do that also for the metadata for um, any digitized uh, images, scans, and for the full text that we produce from it. Um, we actually also, um, since uh, quite a while, um, actively investing efforts to make this data even more useful for AI. So um, we do this by um, really curating, and that means uh, selecting and enriching um, and transforming uh, data and releasing those as uh, data sets with um, uh, suitable documentation. And this is um, what um, um, yeah, I want to stress with curation. So that means uh, we have um, access points uh, where um, issues with this data can report, be reported. We uh, continuously update and improve these data sets. And um, yeah, we provide um, a lot of contextual information surrounding these data sets to improve their reusability in research and AI contexts. And of course, we do so also by going to the main platforms, for example, like Hugging Face, where we actually attract uh, the, the AI and machine learning community to really make use of these, these data sets. Um, we are also working uh, with uh, a Europeana working group to um, create um, yeah, really best possible documentation and contextual knowledge um, around these data sets. And we've been adopting an approach um, coming from the machine learning industry, uh, Timnit Gabriel et al, uh, data sheets for data sets. And um, this was uh, basically aligned with the um, specific context of uh, the cultural heritage sector, uh, providing uh, both um, um, uh, recommendations and a template for others to reuse in order to document and publish uh, cultural heritage institution data for the purpose of AI and make it really as useful uh, uh, as possible for these purposes. Coming to copyright data, we um, have been also pushing uh, for better access options here. Um, we um, have been uh, using the concept of the data space um, by uh, utilizing um, a high performance computing system um, that is federated and decentralized, um, implementing uh, a protocol that allows uh, to handle um, access and licenses on a quite granular level. And in this way, it is uh, possible to use algorithms um, in a compute to data way um, and create uh, derivative products um, also from the uh, copyright content that can then be um, accessed. But of course, um, there are some uh, barriers and, and obstacles to maneuver this. Uh, um, but generally, we, um, we are pushing uh, to, to create also options um, for our data to be used under these circumstances. Now, um, on the other hand, what we are uh, continuously or now in more and more experiencing is, of course, that also our website and online assets um, are accessed and harvested by web crawlers of AI companies, um, often in a quite uh, aggressive way. So sometimes we are even uh, required to uh, throttle them down or, or lock them out for short time frames just to protect our resources for our regular users. Um, what is, however, more worrying from our view is that these web crawlers are not really targeting the good and quality information and assets that we provide, but rather looking at the wrong or incomplete assets. And speaking from the point of view of a developer of uh, AI and machine learning, 
um, we are very well uh, aware that context is really king for training good AI models. And so we would like, um, of course, um, our data to be used with these contexts that we provide through yeah, considerable efforts. So uh, that means, of course, also its provenance, uh, the documentation, for example, provided through these uh, data sheets that data sheets that we create. So uh, we don't think this is an ideal use of the uh, content and the uh, knowledge and, and curation and efforts that go into it. Um, and we would rather yeah, look for other uh, more collaborative ways to, to really exploit um, those possibilities. Because yeah, if we just simply block the crawlers in the end, of course, no one benefits. So um, what um, I would like to argue for is really um, a better maybe culture for an, an environment for data collection and uh, curation also for AI, because yeah, um, the data that we have in our cultural heritage institutions have a very high quality. They are selected really by subject, in, uh, subject experts in their fields due to their relevance. So this is of course highly suitable for, for uh, training AI models. And um, we have it in large uh, volumes and um, from uh, multiple languages and, and domains. So the variation and diversity uh, would be perfect to really uh, create powerful um, and, and yeah, uh, good AI models for the benefit uh, of everyone in society. Um, but secondly, also, I think um, and this is, uh, something that we um, have been pushing for also in our organization and with uh, leadership in the cultural heritage sector. Um, we must um, create opportunities to really leverage the, the expertise about these data in the cultural heritage organizations and um, in the curation, updating and maintenance of these data sets and in the documentation and contextualization of these uh, digital assets in order to really um, yeah, um, utilize their full potential. So um, I would um, yeah, like to ask the question uh, really like how can we create a better environment and empower cultural heritage institutions to really leverage um, their data and their expertise to support the collection, but also the creation of really high quality data sets that can be used for training AI and in this way uh, create better uh, AI models for everyone, including researchers and commercial parties. And I, we believe that this um, requires an open dialogue and also really flexible ways um, to enter uh, into corporations that um, in our belief will be much more beneficial for both sides uh, and everyone um, who is uh, using or impacted by AI then um, yeah, be um, hindered by the legal restrictions that in the end lead to neither the uh, data nor the expertise about the data really um, finding their way into the AI models and ecosystem. And I think, yeah, with that um, bit short, maybe I caught up some time, I would like to end and open uh, the floor for the discussions, I guess. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clemens. I think one, once again, just uh, there's some fantastic examples of, of what it's possible to do with AI. I think there's a, a point that Rachel also underlined earlier that fundamentally a lot of this is not different to what was done before. It's taking ideas, it's, it's legitimately accessing a text as it's written, it's extracting the ideas and doing something further with it. So uh, yeah, again, it, it, it points in a really positive direction. In terms of all the things that can actually be done, I think as, as you are highlighting the the potential, if you actually allow libraries and research centres, etc., to 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 work with it as freely as possible, then actually you've got a greater hope of ending up with something ethical, something that actually fulfils all these goals that we have right now. So, um, indeed, yes. So as you said, we're going to go into questions. I'm going to ask a first question, um, and then I encourage anyone else. We've got three questions in the chat at the moment in the Q and A button, but I do want to encourage people to ask more. So I think that the first question is looking up um, the, the library leadership. Um, what can those in power do to sort of support the goals that, that, that you, Clemens, have set out in Berlin, that, that, um, that you, Rachel, have set out at, at University College, Bar University of California, Berkeley? 
what 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 should library bosses do? Um, Ben, do you want to go first? You were the first of the three. Yes. Um, I don't. I, it's not about library leaders per se. It's about leaders within the 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 research within research organisations. You know, so that's vice chancellors, um, vice provosts, library directors. You know, uh, um, you know, I. I, I, at the fun, fundamental point about what these organisations do is research, and therefore fun, fundamental to the mission of these institutions is how they can use information that sits in their collection or that their their institution has lawful access to. So, so I, I think it is absolutely important that copyright and licensing issues which are the things that determine how you can undertake research are taken seriously by the leaders of these institutions you know the understanding not necessarily the detail of it but but the importance of it and and understanding it to a certain extent absolutely should be a core skill and a core requirement of leaders in 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 universities and across the cultural heritage sector you know in the way that they 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 they're taught about communications or they're taught about how to you know manage people from a human resources perspective they should they have to understand about technical infrastructures they need to understand balancing budgets you know understanding digital copyright and licensing issues has to be a core skill i think of of senior management across our sectors. Um, can you, I add then, something to that? Yeah, go for it, Rachel. Um, it, it would be great <laughs> if senior leaders uh, learned those fundamental skills. Um, I think, though, um, the, the question is framed around what should senior leadership do? And I actually think the uh, Groundswell needs to come from below uh, and not top down because you are going to get nowhere if you do not uh, bring your researchers on board and help them to understand what these tools are doing and how they are already being used in research to get their support and buy-in for what the library needs to do in terms of licensing. I can tell you that while you know we're a leading public research institution, so many people are using, have been using AI tools, third-party AI tools, both non-generative and generative for years, but you have a tremendous amount of the, the faculty who doesn't understand how tools have been used in text and data mining for years. And if we hadn't gone step by step to do outreach and to, um, get the the faculty committees on board to support this work the the um opposition would have been so enormous but it would have been entirely based on mis misunderstanding so um as much as i think it's really important for the leadership to take ownership of these issues uh really you need to uh, get the researchers on board and that means within the library you need to understand how the technology works. If you're going to be licensing these um, these tools, you need to understand. Okay, in this instance, I you know our researchers are making typically making third party uses of tools. I can see that. Um, so I know I can't uh, like you know I can't agree to anything that's going to restrict usage of third party tools. That education also needs to happen for the people who are doing the licensing. Excellent, thank you. And I think that that underlines again so many of those points that you were making. About these are core functions. This is just what the core function of a library can look like in the twenty first century. Clemens, any take from you? Um, yeah, um, I, I agree with both uh, other speakers, and I can probably just add again or reiterate what what I said in my slides. I think um, there is a really great potential, both not in only in terms of the data, but also in terms of the expertise in the cultural heritage organization and especially also in their close ties with the communities from the research uh, uh, and scientific fields. And so um, what I would in an ideal world like to see is that the uh, 
for example, libraries, cultural heritage organizations who have been um, really um, in, a, in a huge digital transformation for uh, the last decades, um, changing also their uh, self-understanding from uh, protectors of uh, heritage objects to really open information infrastructures um, to really not take a step back again now being threatened or pushed into a more passive role through the yeah, um, AI and maybe some of the hype uh, that comes with it, but that we really um, take ownership again of our, um, of our assets and our expertise and um, enter into a more yeah, like fruitful um, kind of exchange that, like I said, um, allows us in flexible ways to really make use of, of these uh, potentials um, in collaborations that, um, like I said, are flexible to um, adhere to the requirements of uh, particular research cases under consideration of particular uh, collections. Um, but yeah, really um, actively um, use or, or step up to that role, um, which of course, um, and I have to say that since most of my team is only partly uh, um, part-time, uh, no, not part-time, it's not permanent, but uh, funded through projects. This comes of course with additional efforts also for which we need uh, permanent staff and, and funding um, in the cultural heritage organizations to support this kind of really, I believe, valuable uh, effort going forward. Thank you, thank you so much. And again, just underlining that point about all, all that is possible with the right support, with the right backdrop. And, and I think also just going back to something that Ben was saying at the beginning, I know an argument that we often make is that a copyright is one side of the same coin as funding in the first place. And if you care about your funding, you should also be caring about the copyright because that's effectively, it, it, that's what determines how much impact you can have, how far you can get out there, how far you can get it, how, how far you can get beyond the hype around AI. So I'm going to take a look at the questions in the Q&A tab um, and just remind everyone on the call that we've still got a good uh, 13 minutes until um, we're up. So um, I suppose I'm just going to go down from the top on these ones. Um, I think there's a quite a practical question about does the, the text and data mining exceptions, do the text and data mining exceptions in the UK and EU allow um, the making of digital copies, so from physical to digital, and uh, do, does it allow them subsequently to be used for text and data mining, or can this only happen with purely digitized, pre-born digital materials? Um, I suspect there's more on the um, Ben and Clemens side, although um, Rachel, if you can give the US take on, on whether it's possible to do digital humanities, to do text and data mining on um, digitized text in the US, that could be good. So. Clemens, Ben, either of you want to take that? Yeah. Um, I so starting with the EU, um I'm racking my brains. I don't think there's anything in the recitals which explicitly talks to this. Um and, and I guess caveat, if you're in the EU, it you need to look at your national legislation. So I can only talk at the EU level. Um so if you look at the directive, I I'm racking my brains. I don't think there's anything in the recitals which talks to this. But um, if you look at Article 3 and 4, it is creating exceptions to the acts of reproduction or extraction in the case of the sui generis database right um, in order to, for the purposes of text and data mining. So Knowledge Rights 21 will always take a purposive interpretation to support research. So I think it's quite safe to say that Knowledge Rights 21 would say that the direct the directive, again, look at your member state law, um, there's nothing there that prevents digitization it, because digitization is making an extraction or a reproduction for the purposes of text and data mining. So I think... It, that would be our position. And then in the UK, again, there, it's about making reproductions for the purposes of data analytics. Um, the, the problem with Section 29A in the UK is that it says that it can only be for the purposes of data analytics. 
So in terms of the law, then, well, what happens if you want to keep that copy for preservation purposes or access purposes? I would also say, you know, copyright is copyright law. Those of us practitioners who work in the sector need to think about risk also. You know, what is really the risk in the case of the UK, for example, of using a, a pre-existing preservation copy or what is the risk of, um, because in the UK, exceptions can sort of sit in parallel. So I think all in all, I you know, the law doesn't seem to prevent it. And therefore, I think Knowledge Rights 21 would take a purposes of interpretation and say yes. Yes, and then if, if, if the law talks about the right to do this and doesn't explicitly exclude, if you want to actually be able to analyse physical texts, you have to digitise them in the first place. And plus, of course, there's the TU Darmstadt model that says that, well, if, to be able to do dedicated terminals, you have to have a digital copy in the first place. Um, I, I, I know, just, just because it, it, it's always interesting to actually see how, how these examples are worked through practically. Um, I don't know, Rachel Clemens would... would would you feel comfortable? Would you feel confident in in digitizing a text and then being able to draw on it to use it in in the work that 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 you would do around AI or or TDM? A million percent. There there isn't even a question in my mind. Um. So the Hadi Trust in Google Books cases that I mentioned uh, were digitizing print materials into digital form so that. Uh, researchers could extract information about them. But even if that hadn't been exactly this scenario of print to, to, digita uh, to digital, all of the fair use cases explain that you you need to make a reproduction, you know, allow that uh, a reproduction copy to be made to do that work. Um, so it, it isn't even a question in my mind that this is permitted. I think it, it go on, Clemens. Yeah, no, I, 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 not much. I, I hope I'm not disclosing us breaking the law here, but I, it's, it's been done in this way. I believe in the example that I've mentioned with the data space, um, where we were also able to not just do analytics, but like also Ben said, this is usually what we need to do to retrain AI models with these data, because this is usually the first thing that we do. We take a foundation model from industry or research, but then we have to fine tune it that is trained with our data. And um, this was uh, possible and done uh, this way in, in this uh, pilot with the copyright uh, uh, data. So um, unless we've violated the law, it should be possible. No. Okay. Uh, and it's producing it's producing results that show what happens when you actually apply uh, uh, AI in a sort of public interest way in a way that actually helps achieve wider goals. And I, I know I'm, I'm conscious that Rachel's had the 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 joy the the benefit of being able to refer to um, what fair use has made possible. And I think that certainly we, we we've seen with the Internet Archive case that that judges will say that there are limits to fair use. Um, but certainly in in the case of um in the case of this in the case of simply digitizing someone to work to use it for AI, it's fantastically positive that you have a, a piece of law that dates back officially from the seventies, but actually quite a lot quite a lot further that allows you to do these things. It doesn't force you to to get some to, to, to seek explicit clarification. And we will share um a link to the work the piece of work that we've done on this knowledge rights twenty one in the chat and that Ben was part of the author team on. Um, so I'm having a look, the questions are coming in both on the um, chat and on the um, Q&A function. Um, so I'm going to ask another one of the ones that are on the chat, and this is um, from Denise, um, about the privacy issues um, when uploading things into an AI tool and should people be worried about it? Does AI actually store that data? Uh, I'll take a first crack at that. So first of all, what um, what I was talking about, and and I think oh, you know certainly what Ben was talking about is is published content from publishers. Uh, these are research articles that have been published. So um, all of the privacy issues uh, associated with protecting uh, researchers. Um, have already been uh, screened for in creating these the public uh, 
public articles. But um, more broadly, uh, it really depends on the tool. We've talked about non-generative tools, which are incapable of producing any kind of, of content. Um, they are merely detecting topics or um, associations. Um, they are, you know, vectors in space. How closely related words are. So there is, there are no privacy concerns. Even if we were setting aside the fact that this is published scholarship, um, there are no privacy concerns in the the uh, non-generative tools. In the generative tools, um, there is some regulation that you would need to. Um, ensure that whatever the output is of the generative tool, um, it, in addition to not infringing the copyright, uh, doesn't uh, harm uh, the privacy of individuals, and that needs to be regulated, but that is not a copyright regulation. Um, that occurs uh, separately uh, um, in this broader landscape of what needs to be regulated. Thank you, and I think that's, that's extremely powerful point. I, I, I know a lot of the time we have people who work on copyright and would love to present copyright as being the solution to absolutely everything. And that's evidently not the case at all. I know policymakers have to use the full range of tools. And um, I think a quick last question, but I, I think this is one that just builds on what you were saying, um, Rachel. What do you think we need to get in place? And, and just thinking to the the, the agenda of the commission um, going forwards, looking to support the work of research institutes, of uh, schools, of universities, of libraries. Um, what what sort of um, what do you think is necessary? What will help these institutes, libraries, etc., not face up to these claims, face up to these efforts to impose some extremely restrictive and arguably inconsistent contracts? Takers, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, Ben, if it... sorry, could you just re rephrase that? I was I was looking at the chat. Yes, I, I know there's different things going on in different places. Um, what do you think would actually reinforce and and, and make sure that the research institutes, universities, libraries are equipped to face up when they're given a contract, when they're sent a contract that effectively asks them to stop doing the thing that they're there to be for in terms of making use of the information they hold in their collections to which they bought access to. I think, you know, there's there's, there's two, two, two things though, as, as Rachel made very clear, and it's great that Rachel has this knowledge, um, you know, your, your, where there is non-contractual override of copyright exceptions, um, you know, universities are sort of negotiating around around that and the interpretation of of the law. So, um, I think you know, first of all, from a research innovation perspective, it's absolutely vital that all the copyright exceptions that relate to education and research libraries, etc., are protected from con contractual override. Um, and then, I think another another important issue is. You know, universities, etc., are you know this is not a free market. Universities cannot negotiate with hundreds and hundreds of content suppliers um, for information that they have to have in order to function. You know, this is not a free market. It is not freedom of contract. It is a million miles away from that. Consumers are protected from unfair contract law. Research institutions, which are hugely important in terms of society and our economy, are not. I think it's absolutely vital that 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 these institutions that we extend sort of concepts around unfair contract law. We protect consumers. We should protect research institutions and research in the same way from unfair contracts. I agree. Um, we don't have Article Three in the U.S. I know you all think our fair use is great, but um, having in the Copyright Digital Single Market Directive uh, a no contractual override uh, is like antithetical to the free market economy in the U.S. and um, uh, is it's unfortunate because, as Ben said, we really need those protections. Um, and I'll just also say one last thing about the labor involved in having to negotiate these. Um, no, I can tell you how much of my time 
is invested in system-wide negotiations to preserve these rights. And that isn't even my job. Um, uh, no institution, even if they have the expertise, has the time to invest in having to fight back against all of this. So carved out protections are essential. And I, that, yeah, I think that's, it's a really powerful point. And, 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 and I think these are things that don't get fed into it. You know, there is a cash value to these things. It's not one that we actually see, but this is also time that is spent that isn't spent actually providing services. And it's a great way of introducing transaction costs, literally transaction costs that really make the whole system also incredibly inefficient and not delivering on things. Um, we, we, we have got to time, and I do want to respect people's time, but given that you know, Ben and, and, and Rachel have answered the last couple of questions, I wanted to ask Clemens if you had a, a, a last thing to mention before we close. Yeah, I think let, just uh, to, to stress again that last point. So we have been investing actually a lot into these kind of negotiations uh, with publishers, and we've built up considerable expertise, but indeed this is of course drawing uh, labor and, and resources from other efforts. At the same time, I think it's still important to really yeah, leave some room for flexible negotiations because we've seen in these uh, agreements that we've entered that um, they can be quite uh, unique and specific and um, also based on the kind of research interest and um, the collections targeted by the researchers, for example. So yeah, the uh, there must be um, still flexibility that allows also for these kind of specific uh, uh, agreements and corporations. Thank you so much. And I think that you know, it, it's a point that I know we make in, in lots of spaces, as long as it's 21, that negotiation can allow that, that really valuable space, but it needs to take place within parameters. We need to be in a situation where no one has an incentive to walk away from the table and where there is actually the law encourages agreement on something that works for both sides rather than allowing either simply the wasting of time or a situation where libraries are left having to pay because that's their role so um I i'm going to draw to a close here to respect people's time um extremely grateful to ben to rachel to um clemens um especially um rachel for getting up so early in the morning um that's fantastic um and as mentioned on the chat, we will be putting the recording of this session up um, as soon as it's processed. So once again, thank you to our speakers. Thanks for all of you who have come along and uh, do keep an eye on our website. We'll be announcing the next webinar in our series soon. So thank you very much.